Good morning. Good morning. Shabbat Shalom. So good to have everyone here with us this morning. Is this a beautiful day or what? Oh my goodness. How many of you like the sun? S O N. Yay, that sun. <laughs> As you know, El Shaddai Ministry is always taking Torah to the nations. And uh, one of the things that we'd like to know right now is, do we have any visitors with us here this morning? Any visitors? Raise your hand. All right. Let's give the visitors a big hand. I see a couple. <clears throat> uh, we'd like to know where you're from. Where are you from? I'm in Seattle. I live in Everett. Okay, great. Thank you. And how about way back there? Where are you? Yeah. Where are you from? <laughs> Tacoma. All right. <clears throat> we always love visitors. Great to have them here. Okay, uh, let's stand as we set apart this Shabbat. All right, together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Together. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Machuto. Lay olam Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Praise be the name of his glorious sovereignty forever and ever. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. And you shall teach them thoroughly to your children. And you shall speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be for a reminder between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. When the word entered the world, freedom entered it. Its highest teaching is love and kindness. And that is the whole Torah. Go and learn it, honoring one another, doing acts of kindness and making peace. These are our highest duties. Amen. Let's uh, lift this time up to the Lord. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father King, we just thank you so much that we can come together in your name to worship on your holy day. Father, we understand you're keeping Shabbat in the heaven. And Father, we want to uh, be the harmonic resonance. We want to be the echo uh, that your will would be done on earth just as it is in heaven. And as we listen to the sound of the shofar, let us uh, realize and remember that we have a new month starting. Tomorrow is the first of Tammuz. May we learn from your word examples of what uh, we are facing and how to respond. We love you in Yeshua's name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen.
<laughs> that was cool. Good job.
moving on the water Who is holding up the moon Who is peeling back the darkness With the burning light of noon Who's standing on the mountains Who's on the earth below Who's bigger than the heavens Lover of my soul If you know it, come on. Who makes me happy? He who gives me peace. Who brings me comfort? Turn my bitter into sweet Who's stirring up my passion Who's rising up in me Who's filling up my hunger With everything I need
Amen. Do you believe his name is holy? Yes. Amen. Let's have the kids come up and we'll pray over all the kids as we dismiss them and pray over the service. All right. Yes. Yes. Oh, we have an announcement. Do you have a microphone? We're going to let you pray for the kids when you're done. I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. Is this on? Okay. Well, I have a very important announcement, a very special one. Tomorrow is this guy's birthday. <laughs> so first... If you guys would raise your hands towards him, extend, not raise, don't raise your hand towards your leader. <laughs> Let's just pray a blessing over our pastor. Father, we do thank you very much for your son. We thank you that, that you have blessed us with uh, Pastor Mark, with the call that you've put on him. We just pray that his blessings, uh, that, that your blessings would overtake him like he always teaches us how that word really uh, means in Hebrew. And we just ask that you would guard and protect him all his life and his family and all that concerns him. And I ask that you would enable him to accomplish all that you have set before him. And uh, I just pray that you would continue to have people on the wall that are always covering him. And just thank you so much in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Ladies. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Pastor Mark. Happy birthday to you. Now, now, who else? Who else? Has a birthday today. Raise I know. Your hand. I saw something today. Doing. Anybody else? Today. I know there's other people. Yes, that's Mr. right. Ballinger. All right. Nice to you to too. You. Happy birthday. <laughs> All right. Thank you. That was very good, you guys. Okay. We should do Let's sing pray along for the roughly. kids. All right. Father, we thank you for all these children that you uh, have sent and entrusted to us, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, all these people. And I just ask that you would um, help them to receive what they have to learn today. We ask that you would keep them safe always and guard their steps the rest of their lives. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen and amen. Thank you. Let's give the worship team a big hand, too. They did so good. Woohoo! You can be seated. All right, uh, let's go ahead and we can uh, bring up the first slide. Uh, Shabbat Shalom to all of you here. Let's give a big Shabbat Shalom to all the nations around the world live streaming. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> Again, as usual, we have around 400 cities and 25 countries live streaming right at this moment. It just amazes me. Uh, one of the things, I, I don't know if this is good news or bad news, I have too much material. And uh, what I'm go I've added some stuff that's not even on your notes at the very end, uh, because a lot of people have been requesting that I talk about the coming solar eclipse on August 21st, and it's uh, relevant. So we're going to also go into that. So fasten your seat belts. Are you ready? Okay, today is the Torah portion. It's about Korah and the Korah spirit. Uh, the first verse we're going to take a look at, though, isn't from this Torah portion. It's from last week's Torah portion as we kind of set the stage. And we won't read the whole verse, but it's from Numbers 14, 27 through 30, where God is saying, how long am I going to bear with this evil congregation? You know, the amazing thing to me is this is talking about God's people. He's not talking about the heathen. <laughs> he's, he's not talking about the those wicked pagan Gentiles. He's talking, he says, the congregation, my people, they're evil. And why, he says, because they're murmuring against me. Who could possibly murmur against God? I mean, think about it. I mean, I can understand why people could murmur about me, but how can anyone murmur about God? What did he ever do wrong? And it's like, uh, my goodness. 
You know, does anybody have a chance if they're murmuring even against God? He said, I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. And then look what he says to Moses. He says, tell them as I live, says the Lord, surely as you have spoken in my ears, I'm going to do to you. Your dead bodies are going to fall in this wilderness. They asked for it. They said, would to God, we would just die here. And so God said, fine, we can arrange that. (laughs) And so let's look at verse 36 and 37. It talks about the men that Moses sent to spy out the land. They returned and they made, they made all the congregation to murmur against the Lord, it says, by bringing up an evil report against the land. Okay, even those men who brought up an evil report against the land, they what? They died by the plague before the Lord. If you remember last week, we talked about how the Lord had already spied out the land. He had already checked it out. He said it was a good land. He tells them it's a good land. He tells them, I don't know, 600 some times you're going to inherit the land. And here, we don't like your land. Wow. And then let's look at verse 39 through 42. It continues. Moses told all these words to the children of Israel. That they're going to have to wander for 40 years. And the people mourned greatly. So what did they do? They rose up early in the morning. They went up to the top of the mountain. And they said, okay, we're here. We're here. We're going to go up to the place which the uh, Lord has promised. For we have sinned. And Moses says, why are you disobeying again the commandment of the Lord? It's not going to work. Don't go up. For the Lord is in among you. And you'll be struck down. But what did they do? They went up and God had them struck down. Now, here's the thing about death. Well, as we look at death here, I mean, God says your dead bodies will fall in the wilderness. And we, taught, we read about all these people that died by the plague before the Lord. Uh, they say the first response to mourning someone who's died is denial. You know, and then the second response is anger. And so we're going to kind of take a look at that in this Torah portion. We're going to kind of see that. The first thing they did was deny that. It happened. So we're going to go up to my, today. We did it yesterday. So they deny the whole fact of what the circumstances were. And so now they get defeated and more people die. And now comes the anger. But let's look at Deuteronomy 14, 1 and 2 first. So we can get the idea of people mourning the death of people they know. It says, you're the children of the Lord, your God. You shall not... Cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes for who? For the dead. So here are people who are mourning the dead. And how do they show their mourning and anger? They cut themselves. This is a pagan ritual. Or they rip out the front of their, the hair between their eyes, making a bald spot. And the Hebrew word for baldness there is koraka. And guess what? We get the word Korah from that. Korah means bald. All right? And here we see this mourning ritual is what it is for the dead. And what do we have arrive on our scene in the Torah portion? But all of a sudden, the bald guy. Okay? And I'm not talking about baldness, but it's almost implying his baldness is due to this mourning ritual he may have done at the death of the spies and all of the leaders. And it says, you are a holy people to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his possession above all people who are on the face of the earth. Okay, well, we also see that the Lord has chosen them. Okay, they're to be holy, set apart above all people. Well, what we need to understand, too, is don't allow mourning to turn into rage. Don't allow it to go to the next thing. When you think about it, too, how often do you see families all of a sudden pitting against each other after a death? Causing anger. This, these are just human responses. And what are the other thing is? They're saying don't slash yourself. Don't cut yourself. Separate You know, I think it's interesting that what's happening here in the Torah portion, it's like going from individual mourning to communal mourning. The whole nation is mourning the death of the spies, the death of the 250 princes of the assembly, the death of about 15,000 people who died. And so it's, it's one thing to have denial turn into rage on an individual basis. It's another thing on a whole society basis who's mourning the death 
of a group of people. And so what happens when, like it, the sages say, like, don't slash yourself can also refer, just like we're the body of the Messiah, you know, don't cut yourself off from the body. Don't slash yourself. And then also, they say, it can also be the same as, here, it's dividing the community against itself. And so what happens, just as the individual who's mourning attacks his head to create a bald spot, the community attacks the head of the community. He's following me. And so this is what this Torah portion is about. They're attacking Moses and Aaron. They're attacking God, the ultimate head. But notice this also makes a reference to the holiness of the community. It's a select people. So this week we have the rebellion of Korah with his murmurings that are affecting so many others. And this is right after the sin of the spies. We now have the rebellion of Korah after the deaths as well. So this brings us to the Torah portion, Numbers 16, 1 through 3. Now Korach, or the bald guy, the son, look at who he was. He was the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of who? Levi. So Korah was a Levite. And then what does he do? He takes these two guys from the tribe of Reuben, Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben. What did they do? They took men. They rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, and they were famous. These were men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, you take too much upon you seeing all the congregation are holy, every single one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then do you lift yourselves up above the congregation of the Lord? Okay, well, here's what's kind of fascinating. You can see his motivations. There's an overt motivation and a covert motivation. Overtly, he's saying everyone is holy, which is almost like communism. Okay, which is what this is. I mean, all of Israel has been set apart, but there's levels of holiness. That's why you have the common people, the Levite, and then the priest. But What's amazing is covertly, even though he says everyone is the same, he says, but I should be the leader. Overtly, that's what he's saying. Covert, overtly, he's saying we're all the same. Covertly, he says, but if anyone should be the boss, it should be me. But look at number 16, 10 through 12. It says, Moses is speaking, and he says, he has brought you near to him and all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you. And you seek the priesthood also? So here you see not all the Levites were priests. The vast majority were not priests. He says, for which cause both you and all your company are gathered against the Lord. And then he says, what's Aaron? That you murmur against him. So then it says, Moses called Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. And they said, what? We're not coming up. If you remember, Moses just got on saying, don't go up. And they went up and they all died and now Moses says come up and they say we're not going up so what did Moses say then you're going down <laughs> <laughs> so look at how they responded is it a small thing that you brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey referring to Egypt to kill us in this wilderness that you must also make yourself a prince over us who said that Dathan and Abiram, right? They're troublemakers. And I don't know if you knew it, but they are troublemakers from the get-go. They say they are the same two people back in Exodus 2, 13 and 14, where Moses goes out the second day. And it's, it's two men of the Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to him, who did the wrong, why do you strike your fellow? And he said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? This was Dathan and Abiram that were the two that were fighting. And we see the same phrase from the very beginning. They've been troublemakers. And so it says Moses was afraid and he goes, I'm out of here. But here's the other thing. We, we see Korah was jealous because he was from the tribe of Levi and he couldn't be a priest and he wanted to be a priest. Well, what is Dathan and Abiram's problem as the sons of Reuben? Well, we know Reuben was the firstborn. And the right of the firstborn is paramount. And he got booted out as being the firstborn. 
Uh, in 1 Chronicles 5.1, it talks about the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of who? Joseph, the son of Israel. So uh, Reuben was Leah's firstborn, but now instead the big competitor, Rachel, her firstborn, uh, Joseph receives the honor. And so Reuben Camp is not real happy. And uh, out of the 250 princes, uh, some people say they were mostly from Levi. That's not what the sages say. The sages say the 250 princes were mostly from the tribe of Reuben. Uh, and guess what? They all met their death simply because they were influenced by their disgruntled, murmuring neighbors. That shows you how important it is not to associate with grumbling, murmuring people. Um, but this also points to the awesome consequence that the influence of friends, neighbors, and the people you associate with can have on you. Uh, so the question is, who do we surround ourselves with? Negative people who are always murmuring about others or those uh, you know, within the body of Messiah? So now, let's take a look at this. I want to show you what I mean. Let me go to my little paint stick. Okay, so here we have on the east, you know, was Judah and Issachar and Zebulun. To the north was Asher, Dan, and Naphtali. To the west was Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh. But now we go to the south, Reuben, Gad, and Simeon. And you're going to find out uh, in Numbers 2, verse 10, it says, On the south side it shall be the standard of the camp of Reuben. So he's the leader, and then Gad and Simeon were also on the south side. So just who was Korah? Well, let's take a look here. Uh, let's go there. Okay, uh, Aaron and his sons were the only ones that were priests. They were from the tribe of Levi. But I want you to notice something. Here is another layout of how they were. And notice on the south side, we had... Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. Okay, well, Kohath had four sons, Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. And what do we find? These guys are brothers. These are all brothers. Amram and Jochebed give birth to Moses, and Amram was the firstborn. Well, look at this. Uncle Izhar gives birth to Korah. And then you have Hebron, and Uziel gives birth to Elizaphon. Now, here's what's fascinating. You have to realize Korah and Moses were first cousins. Their dads were brothers. And yet, Korah was not a priest. And he's all upset. And one of the reasons he's upset, you're going to see, is because the prince of this tribe did not become Korah. He gave it to Elizaphan. And so this is, was a lot of Korah's problem. Let's, let's look at this here. In Exodus 6.16, it says these are the names of the sons of Levi. And he mentions Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. In verse 18, it talks about the four sons of Kohath being Amram, Ishar, Hebron, and Uziel. In verse 20, we see Amram took Jochebed, and she bare him Aaron and Moses. And then in verse 21, we see the sons of Ishar was who? Korah. There it is. So Korah was a firstborn. And then in verse 22, it talks about the sons of Uziel. You have Mishael and Elizaphan. And uh, what's interesting, Ishar's name basically is, uh, he's the son of the anointing oil. And so it's amazing that here he is, the son of the anointing oil, and he doesn't get it. And so in Numbers 329, we also see the families of the sons of Kohath will pitch on the south side of the tabernacle. So here's my point. Look who is next door neighbors to Korah. Reuben. This is why Korah is mourning. Or he's mourning and he's raging and he's all upset. And he grabs the, grabs the princes of the tribe of Reuben. Dathan and Abiram and these other princes. It just so happened they were neighbors. And so that's who they're grumbling uh, with. Now... Uh, look at Numbers 3.30. It says, the chief of the house of the father of the families of the Kohathites, all of them, all four brothers, the chief is going to be Elizaphan, the son of Uziel. So Korah is very upset that he's being passed over. Now, how do you deal with angry, upset people? Uh, one might say, well, if God and Moses would have just appeased Korah and given him an important position, he wouldn't have become angry or rebellious and all this trouble could have been avoided and we could have had peace. 
how do you deal with terrorists? I mean, this is, uh, I mean, this the, on the, the global scale, terrorists, do you think appeasing them, they're going to stop? I don't think so. Uh, so let's go to number 16, 4 through 7. So when Moses hears it, he falls on his face and he speaks to Korah and to all of the people with him. And he says, in the morning, the Lord is going to show who are his and who is holy. And he will cause him to come near to him. Even him who he shall choose, he will cause to come near to him. Now, do you remember what happened to Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, when they offered strange incense? Dead. So Moses says, okay, take, do this, guys. Go burn some incense. <laughs> we'll see. You know, he says, take censers, Korah, and all his company. Put fire in them. Put incense on them before the Lord tomorrow. And it'll be that whoever the Lord chooses, he'll be holy. And the rest of you will be gone. <laughs> so let's look at verse 21 through 27. You know, the time has come and he says, separate yourselves from among this congregation, God said. God is speaking here because he says, I'm going to consume them all in a moment. And so what did they do? They fell on their faces and says, oh, God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin. And will you be wroth with all the congregation? And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the congregation. Get the heck out of here. Okay, I mean, uh, you know, Moses thought, hey, it worked the last time when I fell on my face. Uh, maybe it'll work this time. And, and God says, no, this time I'm too upset. You and everybody better just leave. And so uh, it says, he says, get away from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And so what did happen? Moses, what did he do? He rose up. He goes, okay, I got it. I'm out of here. And he went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart, everybody, from the tents of these wicked men, and don't touch anything of theirs, lest you're consumed in all their sins. So all the neighbors, they got up, and they ran for their lives from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives and their sons and their little children. Well, you know what's fascinating as I read this, I wonder, well, where did On, the son of Peleth, go? Remember, On was the third guy? Where did he go? Well, he was a very smart man. He listened to his wife. <laughs> his, uh, the, the story goes that the wife said, you better do nothing against Moses, against God. And so On, you know, he decided he'd get off. <laughs> And he left. All right. He wised up. And so we see in verse 30 and 31. It says, uh, but if the Lord make a... See, Moses is talking to all these people. You know, and he says, look, if the Lord makes a new thing, this is something brand new. And the earth opens up her mouth and swallows them up with everything that they have. And they go down how? Alive into the pit then you're going to understand that these men provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, just as soon as he made an end of speaking all these words, the ground clave asunder that was under them. Wow. And then look at verse 33 and 35. They and everything that appertained to them went down alive into the pit. And then what? The earth closes. How often do you see like a mouth with an earthquake? It opens, but then it closes again. And they perished from among the congregation, and all of Israel that were round about them were fleeing at the cry of them, for they said, the earth is going to swallow us up also. And then we see a fire comes out from the Lord and consumes the 250 men that had offered incense. Oh, my goodness. I mean, here the earth is cracking open. Everyone's falling into it. Another whole group, uh, they're, you know, getting killed by fire. Let me see which one, which one do I have there. Yeah, let's go to the fire. You know, now, who brought this fire from the Lord? Or who brought the fire that killed them? The Lord, right? Who opened up the, could, can Moses open up the earth and cause an earthquake and cause it to close? Can Moses send fire out from heaven? Absolutely not. And uh, let's take a look at Revelation 19 and 20. I thought it was fascinating that they went down alive. And here in Revelation 19 and 20, it talks about the beast was taken and within the false prophet that wrought miracles. Those that deceived everybody had received the mark of the beast and those that worshiped his image. And it says these both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. 
Do you know that the beast, the false prophet, and Korah, his group, are the only people recorded in the Bible as descending into a pit without first experiencing physical death? They went down alive. So Korah kind of helps us understand the nature and the sin of the Antichrist, who establishes his own authority, his own commandments, his own anointing, his own religious practices, uh, and the similarities that exist between Korah's rebellion and the Antichrist rebellion are phenomenal. Uh, so by studying Korah, uh, we can see how the Antichrist is going to manipulate people and come to power. He's going to take men. And so this tells us that the generation prior to the return of Yeshua will also fall away and continue to do so until they cannot discern between the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit and the power and authority of a self-made ruler. They, they couldn't tell the difference. Korah is claiming that God's divine election didn't take place at all. In other words, he's saying God picking the sons of Aaron, that didn't happen. Moses just made that up. Okay, he's saying Moses and Aaron are self-appointed leaders. So Korah is not only undermining Moses, but he's also undermining all of the scriptures as well that were given to Moses. Think about this for a moment. This is important. If Moses merely exalted himself, then his claim to speak for God is invalid and the Torah becomes a mere human document. You following me? Moses just decided to write this really cool book and it wasn't from God. If all the people are equally holy, then anyone and everyone can produce a holy book on par with Torah and there will be many spiritual paths to choose from. So Korah not only challenged the authority of Moses, he also challenged the authority of the Torah and the sovereignty of God, which goes into why I'm so against replacement theology. Because you're saying, like Korah, if you're following replacement theology, that God did not choose Israel. He chose us instead. Do you see how this can have huge consequences? Now, let's look at Psalms 106, 13 through 18. We're not going to read all of it. But it talks about the generation, and it says, They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness. They tempted God in the desert. He gave them their request, it says, but he sent what? Leanness to their souls. And again, as I mentioned earlier, all of this was not happening to the atheist, the agnostic, the unbeliever. This rebellion was totally within the body of the Messiah. Look at verse 24 and 25 of Psalm 106. He says, Yea, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not in God's word, but murmured of their tents and hearkened not to the voice of the Lord. That's in Psalms 106 talking about this Torah portion. But here's what's amazing. After you just saw the earth swallow Korah and close up, you saw a fire from the Lord kill the 250 leaders, self-appointed leaders. Then you have 15,000 people die from murmuring right after that. Look at what happens the next day, number 1641. On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron saying, you're the ones who killed the Lord's people. I can just see Moses going, oi, they. <laughs> you know, I'm, and look at this, verse 44 and 48. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, okay, get away from among this congregation. I'm going to consume all of them in a moment. What does Moses do? And Aaron, they fall on their faces again. Okay, here they're falling on their faces. But look at this. What, what did God tell them to do? To run. Right? And why did he tell them to run? He's going to consume everybody. What did Moses and Aaron do? They don't run. They fall flat on their face. Why did they fall flat on their face instead of running when God said to run? They're hoping maybe if we don't run, he won't consume them. Maybe if we just stay here, maybe we can, you know, make a difference. So... It says, then what happens, though? Moses says to Aaron, 
you better do something. <laughs> I'm going to stay here and try to intervene, but you better go get your censer, put a fire from off the altar in it, lay incense on it, and carry it quickly into the midst of the congregation and make atonement for them. Because wrath has gone out from the Lord, the plague has begun. So Aaron did as Moses said. He ran to the midst of the assembly, and behold, the plague began among the people. And he put on the incense, and he made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Wow. So Moses is thinking, maybe I can prevent or mitigate this plague if instead of running, I intercede. And I think, again, this is what is so important about so many people who are afraid of the tribulation. There's nothing wrong with being the tribulation. I mean, we're all going to die anyway. What difference does it make? I mean, I'm, that's just me. But it's just, it's a matter of, do we want to run? Or are we the, the attitude of, let's see if we can't go in and make, who knows if God may not do something. Yeah. You know, so. Anyway. So let's look at number 1649. It says, they that died in the plague were how many? 14,700. And that was besides those that died in the matter of Korah. Do you know what? Murmuring and complaining is what released these destructive forces. When are we going to learn from history? They say the one thing we learn from history is we don't learn from history. Uh, number 17, 12, and 13, the children of Israel spoke to Moses saying, Behold, we're all dying. We're all going to perish. We're all going to perish. Whoever comes near the tabernacle of the Lord is going to perish. Are we going to be consumed with dying? Wow. Well, look at 1 Corinthians 10, 10 and 11. It says, don't murmur. You, as some of those also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, all these things happened to them for what? Examples were written for our admonition on whom the ends of the world are come. I tell you what, if they felt they were the generation on whom the ends of the world have come 2,000 years later, we are really the generation upon whom the ends of the world have come. Everyone knows that verse, these things are written for examples, right? But most of them don't know the context is murmuring and complaining. So uh, that's what the context is. But let's go to number 17, 8 through 10. So let's see how God solves this. It came to pass on the morrow that Moses went into the tabernacle. And behold, if you remember, they took one rod from all 12 tribes. And it was the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. And so Moses brings out all the rods from before the Lord. So all the children of Israel could look on them and took every man his rod. And the Lord says to Moses, OK, bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against two. The rebels so that Aaron's rod that budded was kept by the Ark of the Covenant as a token against rebels. And you will quite put away their murmurings for me that they don't die. Now, here, here's what one of the sages asked. They said, if God had performed a miracle of the rod and the staff before punishing the rebels, they maybe would have repented with no need for such a severe punishment that 14,700 of them die. Why didn't he do that first? You know, why did God wait till after the death of the 15,000 rebels to prove that Aaron was the chosen one to be the first high priest? You ever wonder that? How, you know, the order of events, how come God didn't do that first? Well, here's what they say. Maybe God knows miracles won't affect your heart. Look at the miracle of the dead branch of Israel sprouting and budding forth, blossoming into a nation back in 1948, and the world doesn't even recognize that miracle. Before Israel could win the battle against the enemy in the promised land, they had to win the battle between the flesh and the spirit within the camp, the battle amongst themselves and within themselves. Now, in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, it, everyone's familiar with that verse where it talks about how the Messiah wants to present his bride not having any spots, right? Or wrinkle or blemish. Well, what is a spot? Well, what's fascinating is if you go to Jude 1, 11 through 13, it mentions three spots. It says, woe to them, for they've gone in the way of Cain. They ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and they perish in the gainsaying of Kor. These are spots. So in Ephesians, the bride is to be without spot. He's saying the bride is to be without the way of Balaam, the way of Cain, the way of Korah. Now, if you remember when it came to Dathan and Abiram and Korah, it talks about how Dathan and Abiram came with all their wives and sons and daughters and children, and they all died in the earthquake, right? How about Korah's kids? Did Korah's wife and kids all die as well? No, none of them died. 
Only Korah's died because Korah's wife and kids, when God said to get up and ran, run, they got up and ran. Uh, look at uh, Numbers 26 and 11. It says, notwithstanding, the children of Korah died not. As a matter of fact, did you know that Korah's descendants managed to break away from the generational curse of jealousy and bitterness? Korah, the sons of Korah, wrote 11 of the Psalms. And the sons of Korah were the musicians and the singers in the house of the Lord. Uh, in First Chronicles 9.19, it talks about Shalom, who was the son of Korah, the son of Abisath, the son of Korah, and his brethren of the house of his father. The sons of Korah were known as the Korahites. And look at this. They were over the work of the service. They were keepers of the gates of the tabernacle. And their fathers being over the host of the Lord, they were keepers of the entry. So the sons of Korah actually became the temple guards, the gatekeepers. And if you look at 1 Chronicles 6, 31 and 32, it says, These are they whom David set over the service of song in the house of the Lord after the ark had rest. They ministered before the dwelling place of the tabernacle of the congregation with singing. And if you go a few verses down in verse 37, it talks about some of them were the son of Korah, the son of Ishar, Korhath, Levi, the son of Israel. So the sons of Korah, even though they were never priests as Levites, they did get to have the honored position of being the musicians and the singers and the gatekeepers. Uh, did any of the sons of Korah ever get to become a priest? Anybody know? Did any of the I mean, they weren't, even, they weren't even sons of Aaron. Did anyone know of any son of Korah who ever became a priest? I do. <laughs> Samuel. Woo. Yeah, Samuel was a son of Korah. Amazing. But let's go to the Hoff Torah. Is from Isaiah, the last chapter of Isaiah, chapter 66. It says, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. And he says to David, what kind of a house are you going to build me? <laughs> you know, I'm pretty big. And what place will be the place of my rest? And then God says, look, for all these things, everything that you see, the sun, the earth, the moon, I made all these things. And all these things came to be, says the Lord. So he says, look. It's to this man will I look, even to him who is poor and of contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Now look at verse 7 and 8. This is incredible. It even ties into what I'll be talking about here in a little bit. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she delivered a son. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in one day? What is this talking about? Okay, Israel becoming a nation, the birth of at the UN, boom, in one day, there's a nation is born. Shall a nation be brought forth at once? As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. I think this is just so significant. I mean, you hear of a person being born in one day, but an entire nation being born in one day? In 1948, this is the, you are living in prophetic times. You have to realize this. And there's something very phenomenal about this that I'm going to talk to. But first, I want to talk a little bit about what month we're beginning tomorrow. It is the month. It is the month. It <laughs> is the month of Tammuz. And Tammuz has to do with the tribe of Reuben. And you're going to see why. This is very incredible. Okay, what we're going to do here. We're going to go back again. If you'll notice, the south side of the tabernacle. Um, if you remember, the last three months were focused on the east side of the tabernacle. You know, Nisan, Iyar, Savan was Judah, Issachar, Zebulun. Now we swing over to the south side because the calendar just keeps moving. And so the next month is Reuben, and that has to do with Tammuz, and then we have uh, Av has to do with the tribe of Simeon, and the Gad has to do uh, with the month of Elul. So those are the next three months on the south side. Now, what does Tammuz and Reuben have in common? Why is that? Well, do you remember what Reuben's name means in Hebrew? 
Ben is sun. Ru, Ray, is to look. Leah said, look, a sun. So she called him Ruben, see a sun. So the month of Tammuz has to do with sight. Next month, Simeon, ever hear the word Shema? Here, Simeon and Shema go together, so the next month has to do with hearing. But this month we're about to enter has to do with our eyesight. How many of you know beauty is in the eye of the beholder? Okay, talk about a diamond in the rough. Some see this diamond in the rough and they go, that's nothing, but other people see the diamond in the rough. How about a priceless piece of art at a garage sale? How many of you hear about the people, you know, what's that one show with the... Yeah, the road show, Antiques Road Show. And, you know, what someone's garbage is someone else's treasure. They see something that the other people don't see in it. You know what I'm talking about? Again, like I said last week, it's all about perspective. When you see something, do you see it as a junk piece of art? Or do you have the discernment to know it's really a priceless piece of treasure and you better go get it? But it's all perspective. It's always perspective. And do you know that you can look at the Torah portions for every month and see how it has to do with that month? For example, Tammuz is the tribe of who? Which has to do with... And the four Torah portions are, uh, typically for Tammuz, Shalak, Korah, Chukat, and Balak. And all four have to do with sight. Look at Shalak. It's the ten spies. They begin searching in the month of Tammuz. Numbers 13, 25 through 28. They're spying out the land. Uh, we see... Uh, that they brought back word to all the congregation and they showed them the fruit of the land. And the last verse says, we saw the children of Anak there. And then in verse 33, we saw the Nephilim and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. So we were in their sight. Well, Caleb and Joshua saw the very same thing, but came away with a totally different perspective. And uh, in case you want to know, the end of July this uh, begins just as the beginning of July is Tammuz. The end of July starts the next month, which is Av. And the Torah portion that we've just been covering today, Korah, you know, is around the month of Av. But if you remember also in Numbers, we have the law of the seat seat last week. And what were you to do? Look at it, having to do with sight. Now we have Korah. And in number 16, he says, are you going to put out the eyes of these men? We're not coming up. Again, sight. Number 17 and 8, it says, behold, they looked and saw it was Aaron's rod that budded. And then we have Chukot. And what do we see? There's fiery serpents that were biting everybody and Israel dies. So God tells Moses to make a fiery serpent. And when people see it, they will live. So both times they see a fiery serpent. But it's their perception changes when they have to look up. He says, put the serpent on a pole and lift it up. And so here we see that they both saw serpents, but one time they see it, they live because they're looking up. And then we see Balak in Numbers 22, verse 2. Balak, the son of Zippor, he saw what Israel had done. Numbers 22, 23, even the donkey gets to see the angel of the Lord. Numbers 22, 31, the Lord opens the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel. Numbers 25, 6 and 7, it says, Behold, uh, one of the children of Israel come and brought to his brothers a midnight woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the congregation of Israel. And we saw that Phinehas, the son of the Azer, the son of Aaron the priest, he saw it, and he rose up and took a spear in his hand. So I think it's fascinating that the Torah, so the next month, the Torah portions might have to do with hearing. But so this is so important that this month we're about to enter tomorrow for the next month. We have to be careful about how we look th at things, how we see things, because we have to look at things from God's perspective. Now I'm going to go into something. Wow, I can't believe it. I'm on time. <laughs> I was concerned. I was kind of speeding through this because I, I really wanted to get to this. The other stuff has been good, I hope. But Okay. You know, tonight is the beginning of the, the new month of Tammuz from the new moon. I don't know if you know this, but you can only have 
a solar eclipse on a new moon. You can only have a lunar eclipse on a full moon. You can only have a solar eclipse on a new moon. Now, what do the scriptures have to say about eclipses? In Genesis 1.14, everyone knows, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to divide the day from the night and let them be for what? Signs. Okay, the number one reason God made the sun and the moon was for what? Now, see, this proves the existence of God because what are the odds that we would live on a planet that has a moon going around it that's at the right angle from the sun, the right dimensions to even have an eclipse? It's so astronomical, they can't even determine the odds of there being an eclipse because it's so mathematical how everything has to work. But we just read in Genesis, God created the sun and the moon for, and look at Luke 21, 25, 26. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and on earth, the anxiety of nations, in perplexity for the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting for fear, and for expectation of the things which are coming on the world, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. So let's see, does that make sense? He created the sun and the moon for signs. And so there's going to be signs when the Messiah comes in the sun and the moon. And that's pretty simple, right? But look at this. Why does he say that? Look at Luke 21, 28. The next verse says this. And when all these things begin to happen, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> Hello. Look up and lift your heads because what is near? Wow, that, that doesn't mean the redemption is going to happen on the day of an eclipse. This is just saying when all these different things are happening, we need to look up because these are signs that we are near our redemption. Look at Romans 13, 10 through 12. It says, love doesn't harm a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Doing this, knowing the time, it is already time for you to wake out of your sleep. For salvation is now nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us therefore throw off the words of darkness and let's put on the armor of light. So if we know the times, we're to wake out of sleep. Just like in Luke 21, redemption is near. It says your salvation is now nearer than when we first believed. Well, if this was 2,000 years ago, how many believe we're really close now? Hello. But now look at Luke 21, what it goes on to say then in verse 31 and 32. Even so you also, when you see these things happening, what? The sign and the sun and the moon and the stars. Know that the kingdom of God is near. Most certainly I will tell you, it is this generation that will not pass away until all these things are accomplished. Now, here's what is fascinating too. That at the birth of Isaiah 66 of the nation of Israel, there were signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. There were four blood moons, total lunar eclipses when Israel became a nation. This is tying the signs in the heavens to the birth of the nation of Israel that we read in Isaiah 66. Now, how long is a generation? That is the question. But let's look at something. In Luke 21... Let's go on. Keep reading Luke. Verse 34 through 36. It says, So be careful, or your hearts will be loaded down with carousing, drunkenness, the cares of this life, and that day will come on you suddenly. It'll come as a snare on all those who dwell on the surface of the earth. Therefore, we're to be watchful at all times, praying that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. Who wants to escape them? I'll take escape. I mean, if he wants me to go through it, I'll go. But if he thinks I'm crazy, that's fine. I'll go. So then he says, uh, and to stand before the Son of Man. How many want to stand before the Son of Man? Okay. Now, here's my question. What are the mathematical odds that the moon and the sun would appear to be nearly the same size from Earth? I mean, what are the mathematical odds that the sun and the moon, I mean, if they were different sizes than they are now, it would be hard to have an eclipse, number one. But nobody knows. It's so astronomical. But I want to show you some slides here for a moment. I don't know how. I'm going to give you some basic science. The moon can appear large or small depending on where it is. 
the uh, apogee means far away and perigee means close. So let me show you this slide. The moon's orbit is elliptical, like an egg. It is not always close. When it's at its closest point, it's called the perigee. When it's at its furthest away point, it's called an apogee. Okay, does everyone got that? Because it's elliptical. Now, of course, the Earth is traveling all the way around the sun every year, right? The front and the back. So a solar eclipse happens when the moon comes between the Earth and the sun. Now, if the moon is at its closest point between the moon and the sun versus if the sun's on the other side or if the moon is going around the other side and the Earth, where it's at its furthest away point, it's going to look different. Just like if you hold your thumb up, you can block the whole sun out with your thumb because you're holding it this close. But if you hold it further away, you can see more of the sun. You following me? This is why you can have an annular eclipse. If you have an annular eclipse where the moon doesn't totally blot out the sun, it's because it's, a, it's apogee. It's further away. You have a total eclipse if it's at perigee and it's real close. Does everyone follow me? Okay, I want to make sure everyone understands. But now, when you think about this, what are the odds that the ratio of the size and the distance would be so perfect? They say when you read NASA, the angle even of the eclipse has to be so mathematically precise or it won't even happen. So this tells you God has ordained all of this. But here's an article written by NASA and some other places. Oops, let me go here. Okay, look at what it says. The sun and the moon appear the same size in Earth's sky. Why? It says because the sun's diameter is about 400 times greater. But guess what else? The sun is also about 400 times farther away. You see the math? Okay. Now, look at this bottom thing. The distance to the moon from the solar system exploration at NASA. The distance to the moon is 10 times the circumference of the Earth or approximately how many kilometers? Not miles. This is in kilometers. Okay. So let's take a look at some facts. The sun is 400 times further from the Earth than the moon. The sun is 400 times larger than the moon. And because of that, we can have an eclipse that God created as signs. Which is why we come to the letter Tav, which means a sign or a mark, and its numerical value is 400. Whoa. Do you get it? Isn't that incredible? The very Hebrew letter that means a mark or a sign has a Hebraic numerical value of 400. And the earth and the moon that are created for signs is 400 times larger than the moon, 400 times further from the earth, 400,000 kilometers away. Do you think there's any coincidence in that? I, got that, I had that aha moment yesterday or the day before. Okay, so in biblical terms, what does a solar eclipse mean specifically, if anything? From a biblical point of view, we read that a solar eclipse can be a sign from God. Now, I don't think it's a solar eclipse are always signs from God. I think it depends on when they fall on the biblical calendar, where they occur. That is what makes us stop and take notice. The neat thing about eclipses is it's beyond any man's control or manipulation. All right? Solar eclipses become prophetically significant and relevant when we understand their timing according to the biblical calendar and where they happen. And then what do we do? We look for the patterns that are tied to the historical events. Now, just as the sun is larger than the moon, the sun represents the nations of the world as the world follows the sun for their calendar. The moon represents the nation of Israel as their calendar months are based on the cycle of the moon. Now, not every solar eclipse is a sign from God, okay? But God uses solar eclipses as warnings to the nations whose paths they cross with the prophetic significance heightened when, based on when they fall on the biblical calendar. Is everyone following me? Okay, so now I want to show you some biblical as well as historical 
patterns. Many of you know the story of Jonah and Nineveh, right? But many do not know the historical background events as to what already happened three years before Jonah came. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell you why they repented. It just tells you they repented. We think it was just because Jonah said repent. What are the chances of Iran repenting if the Pope goes over there and says repent? It's not happening. Okay, so the Assyrians hated the Jews. The Jews hated the Assyrians. They took half the, most of Israel, the 12 tri- or 10 of the 12 tribes into captivity. They hated each other, which is why Jonah didn't want to go. Okay, just like you wouldn't want to go to Syria or North Korea or Iran. All right, so there was some background historical facts that they found in archaeological finds in Assyrian cuneiform tablets. So I'm going to tell you what happened prior to Jonah coming. Which is, you're going to, it's like the Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. In 765 BC, a plague broke out in Nineveh. It was so bad, even the king wasn't able to go out to war in the spring, as was the custom. This was followed by a civil war, which was followed by another plague. Okay, all of this is confirmed in these. Uh, tablets that were found in the 19th century. Now, guess what else happened? You have a plague, civil war, plague, then you have a very famous solar eclipse called uh, the Bersagel Eclipse, and it was in 763 BC. The red arrow points to what is now modern Mosul, which was then Nineveh. That was, you heard of our soldiers being in Mosul. Okay, that's Nineveh. And the total solar eclipse goes right over Nineveh. So here they have plague, civil war, plague, total solar eclipse. And then here comes Jonah. Hey, you guys, you better repent or God's coming to get you. Okay, we give up. So these are the things that had happened. Uh, So now the Ninevites saw the wrath of God closing in on them uh, before Jonah even arrived. This was a couple months later Jonah arrived because Jonah arrives on the first day of the month of Elul, which is 40 days before Yom Kippur. He's telling them they have 40 days to repent. This is on the biblical calendar. The first of Elul is very significant. Okay, so this eclipse happens about two months before Jonah arrives on the first of Elul, saying you have 40 days to repent. And he's waiting to Yom Kippur to see if judgment is fallen. He gets in the sukkah in Nineveh, watching to see if God's going to judge them. Okay, so how many of you know God knows how to use the sun and the moon for signs? All right. As a matter of fact, the first of Elul is not only when Jonah began prophesying for 40 days, it's also the very day that John the Baptist was immersing everybody and immersed Yeshua who went for 40 days into the wilderness. It's also the same 40 day time frame, the first of Elul, when Moses went up the second time to get the second set of the commandments coming down on Yom Kippur. The first of Elul is very significant. It has to do with you better repent. Does everyone see that from Moses, the golden calf incident, Jonah, Nineveh, Yeshua, 40 days in the wilderness. Okay. Now, the month of Elul is known as the month of repentance in preparing for the 10 days of awe. And what did John the Baptist say? Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Okay, because he's coming. Yom Kippur, the day of judgment. All right, so now let's look at another historical pattern. All right, this is a map of the Ottoman Empire. How many heard of the Ottoman Empire? That was around for about 400 years or something like that until World War I. It was destroyed. It is said that World War I lasted about four years. You can Google this, and it says roughly from August 1st of 1914 until November 11th of 1918. Okay, those are the dates. But do you know, here they say it began on August 1st of 1914, but do you know three weeks later, on August 21st in 1914, there was a total solar eclipse with the path of totality going directly over Eastern Europe and the Ottoman Empire, including Nineveh. This was the sign of Eastern Europe's involvement and the coming destruction of the Ottoman Empire in World War I. 
So do you see the judgment on the nations? Total solar eclipse going through Eastern Europe, going through Turkey, going through Iraq, right where Nineveh is and Iran. And what do we have? We have World War I. And then and also notice August 21st. When is the solar eclipse this year? Okay, August 21st, 2017. Okay, now we know the solar eclipse back then, we saw a, a world war take place, okay? Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but August 21st, both times, is at the first of a lull. The warning of repentance before judgment comes. Now, let's see. I don't know if you knew this, but on April 6th of 1917, that is when the U.S. entered World War I. Okay, August, April 6th of 1917. So this year, 1917, this last April, was the 100th anniversary. But I don't know if you knew this. Do you know? On June 6th of 1918, there was the Battle of Below Wood that involved the U.S. 2nd Infantry Division. That's when it began. And it was during the three-week fight against the Germans that the Americans experienced their first significant battlefield casualty with 5,000 people killed. So this is America's first major casualty uh, in World War I on June 6, 1918. Well, did you know on June 8, 1918, there was a total solar eclipse going across the United States that was almost identical to the pattern that we're having on August 21st? Okay, and so here we see America gets involved with World War I, and we also have a total solar eclipse across America, and it was 100 years ago that was the last time we had a total solar eclipse across the United States. All right, now... Where am I at? Okay. So after almost 100 years, this August 21st, we will again have a total solar eclipse going over the United States. This is again at the beginning of the month of repentance on the first of a lull. Could God be giving us a warning that we need to repent just as Nineveh or judgment will be coming to the United States? The timing could not be clearer. And here's what's amazing to me is it doesn't mean war is going to come. It means we need to repent. And just as Nineveh was spared, we could be spared. But I believe these are signs in the heavens that God is telling us by looking at the pattern of when it falls, where it occurs, we need to be praying. And here is the path of that eclipse coming August 21st as it goes all the way through from Oregon down through South Carolina. But you'll, I, I stopped it in this video right by St. Louis. And the reason why, I don't know if you knew it, but exactly about seven years later, there's going to be another total solar eclipse across the United States. But this time it's going from the south to the northeast. And what's crazy, St. Louis is in the crosshairs of the two. Okay. Now, why is April A significant? April 8th is the first of Nisan. That's the day of the beginning of the biblical year. That is when the fire fell from heaven. That's when the Moses tabernacle was dedicated. And so you can see this X or this cross right through. And it's exactly seven years later. Now, here's what's amazing also. <clears throat> is this. This is the ancient letter Tav which looks just like the X going across the United States, which is a sign from God. Okay? Now, that's not all. Are you ready for a little bit more? Okay. All right. I'm, I'm already over about three minutes. Can I give me five more minutes? Five more minutes. Another, after this warning of this total solar eclipse, a month warning to prepare and make straight the way of the Lord, right? We come to the fall feast. There's another very significant sign in the heavens that follows a month later. And it happens, coincidentally, between the days of awe from Rosh Hashanah on Tishri 1 to Yom Kippur on Tishri 10. 
there's going to be kind of like a confirmation of celestial events as described in the book of Revelation chapter 12. In verse 1 and 2, it talks about there being a great sign being seen in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was with child. She cried out in pain, laboring to give birth. Okay, well, here's the constellation Virgo. The constellation Leo, which is the lion representing the tribe of Judah, has nine main stars in it. And here you can see, uh, right here, she's clothed with the sun. The moon is under her feet. But I want, you to, I want to point out a couple of facts. Almost every year, Virgo was clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet around Rosh Hashanah. That is normal. Okay, and then you have these nine stars of Leo. But in Revelation 12, it mentions on her head was a crown of what? Twelve stars, which represent the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay, now, but what's amazing is this. There are three planets that are coming through, which has never happened before in history, at this same time, giving her a crown of twelve stars. Now, some people say, well, you can't see it because you can't see this when there's a bright sun out. Well, no one Revelation, nowhere in Revelation 12 does it say you're going to see it. It says John saw it. We're just supposed to be informed that it's going to happen. You're never going to see both the sun and the moon and the stars at the same time. That was obvious. That wasn't the point of God telling this. It was so that we would at least be aware of when it would happen because at least we have the technology now to know it. Okay, so let me go back to this. Now, and you all know Revelation 12 talking about uh, the birth of the man-child, right? Now, here's what's interesting. When it comes to the Bible, the Torah, uh, Michelle Schneeberger sent me this uh, little link the other day uh, talking about the number 70, and it's from a Jewish source. Listen to what they say. And you guys already know this, but it says the number 70 is very critical in the turning points of history. After the flood, there were 70 nations that descended from Noah. 70 languages emerged at the building of the Tower of Babel. The Jewish nation began with the 70 people who came with Jacob to Egypt. In the world to come, the 70 prime nations will recognize God as the one and only ruler of the world. Zechariah 14, all nations come. They slew 70 bulls for the 70 nations. Well, so the number 70 is very significant. Well, get a load of this. Psalms 20 is read every single morning by religious Jews after their morning prayers. Why is Psalm 20 read? Because there are 70 Hebrew words. And they say this corresponds to the 70 years of travail and suffering referred to in the classic text as the birth pangs of the Messiah. So they see the birth pangs of the Messiah lasting 70 years. We see the seven-year tribulation, but they say the birth pangs take place over 70 years, with the natural birth being 1948. And at that begin, the birth pangs of the man-child were now at the 70th year of 1948, 2018. Okay? Uh, so this, this image in the heavens is pointing to 2018, okay? And listen to what it says here. Psalms 20, verse 1 through 9, it also talks about, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The day of trouble is referring to Jacob's trouble. They know the psalm has to do with the tribulation, the birth pangs of Messiah, so they read it every day that the Lord would answer them. And it goes on to say, and this is the verse you all know, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Amen. Okay, and I believe these are signs in the heavens for us to look up. Keeping our eye on Israel as events unfold with the 70th anniversary of their birth as a nation next year in 2018. And I believe this next year and a half will be times of great revelation for those who have an understanding of the times. Uh, may we all merit to see the messianic era when all 70 nations of the world will unite as one with the Jewish people under one Torah and under one God. And as I stated in uh, my book, The Blood Moons, which I think is still very relevant today, these are all signs in the heavens pointing to what is coming. And I believe especially next year, the 70th anniversary, uh, that these are God inserting himself into human history as prophecy becomes fulfilled as never before. So we need to look up. Amen? 
uh, one of the uh, exciting things is this is what I spoke about uh, that's coming out on DirecTV uh, this fall. I went down to California. Uh, we talked about this along with some other people. Uh, and so that'll be three different TV series coming out on DirecTV this fall. We'll let you know when. But anyway, so look up. Amen? Amen. And let's stand up. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I tell you what, we need to be looking up. We need to, uh, because our redemption is nearer than we think. Our redemption draws nigh. And I tell you, you have to totally not know God to not realize the times that we live in. With Israel becoming a nation, recapturing Jerusalem, all the chaos, the anxiety among the nations of the world right now. You've got these signs in the heavens. Uh, the anniversaries of the Jubilee of Israel capturing Jerusalem, the 70th anniversary next year. So it's, uh, we live in exciting times. So let's pray. You can go ahead and play some music if you would. And feel free to come up for prayer. Uh, I believe we may have some prayer team people up here too. And if you want to come and pray and pray for your neighbors, pray for your family, pray for your work people, your relatives, uh, that God would open their eyes because we live in the most exciting time of all history. So let's pray. Father, we just lift this time to you. We ask you that you truly would lead us to repentance. Father, we're entering the, the month of Tammuz. We want to set it apart tonight for you and for those who come to the office tonight to hear Mark Falstead talk about the new moon. Father, may all of us be filled with the joy of having the understanding as the sons of Issachar knowing the times that we live in so we would know what we should do. Father, put it in our hearts not to be murmurers, complainers, and grumblers, but that what we would look at is you returning. How exciting. We want to keep our eyes focused on you. Don't let people bring us down and get us caught up with the cares of this world. It's too important. It's too critical, the times that we live in, that right now, Father, we need to know that we are your daughters and sons. And, and Father, we just want to cling to you with all that we have. For Lord, you truly are good. You are so good. So many see you as a hard man. We see you as good. You're a good, loving Father. You're our Abba. Change our perspective this month. Don't let us judge by the sight of our eyes or the hearing of our ears. Father, we want to judge by your spirit. Father, work in each one of our hearts that we would all see you as good. We wouldn't murmur and complain against you. You want to call us your children. You want to bless us. You want to put your name on us. Incredible. Even as you told Moses to tell Aaron, Ivarekaka Adonai Vayish Mareka, Ya'er Adonai Panavileka Vishuneka, Yisa Adonai Panavileka Vyasam Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And that wonderful name of Eyeh, Asher Eyeh. And Father, we just thank you so much for all of those who are here that allow us to take your Torah to the nations. You are so good. You have given us an opportunity to partner with you, to yoke up with you. Father, what a joy that when you return, Father, we can know we've been working in the kingdom side by side with you. We didn't neglect our duty, but we worked with you. So Father, bless those who give, bless those from all over the world who give, and bless those here who tie them to your work to help advance your Torah to all the nations. In Yeshua's name, and everybody says, amen and amen. Thank you very much.